This is Neil Schneider for MTBS TV. I'm at GDC 2015. To my immediate right is none other than Richard Huddy, Chief Gaming Scientist for AMD. Welcome to the program, Richard. Thank you, Neil. Great pleasure to be here. Always, always. So, I have big announcements that GDC is always from AMD. Mm -hmm. uh, this year's big announcement, Liquid VR. Liquid VR. What can you tell us? Okay, so it's uh, a new SDK um, targeted at VR development and support. Um, it's coming out in uh, alpha format right at the moment, so you have to be a, a key developer who's uh, willing to take a little chance on it breaking maybe in the short term. But we'll finalize this over this year and it'll ship in a, in a good solid form for uh, consumer use in 2015. And it's about reducing latency, giving high frame rates and high quality experience to everyone who wants to develop for or play with VR. Okay, excellent, excellent. So, I'm, of course, I'm, I'm certain it's targeted for AMD graphics cards. Why is it a, a software developer's kit versus a, an API, let's say part of DirectX or, or OpenGL? Is it a separate piece of code entirely? Uh, right now, it's a separate piece of code. It's built on uh, Mantle. Um, I've, uh, I've often referred to the difference between these, these new low-level APIs like uh, Vulkan, um, the new GL, um, or DX12. I talk about them as being our performance APIs. This is where AMD does its really key performance work for games, etc. Um, and on the other hand, we have Mantle for innovation. And this absolutely is innovation. You know, this is 2015, I think, is the year of uh, VR. 2016 is when, as a consumer, you'll get it in large quantities and lots of choice. But 2015 is a wildly exciting time for games developers. And they need access to, to this kind of stuff. They need access to innovation, the stuff that solves the problems that they've been caring about for the last two or three years when they've been looking at VR. So, so something I don't understand is, I mean, you, you're always working to optimize the, the software, you know, between the graphics card and the display, and of course the, you know, the coding that goes through the graphics card. Mm -hmm. Why was a special SDK needed at all? I mean, why isn't it just coded directly to the graphics card like, like anything else? Yeah, you'd, I, I guess you'd hope that would be true, wouldn't it? Why doesn't it just all go through the graphics card? And the answer is that VR has some pretty demanding special requirements. There are things like the fact that if you want a VR experience to remain compelling and satisfying, you've got to hit about 90 or 100 frames a second. Um, if you're a, a guy who plays a, a console game at home, you're probably perfectly happy with 30 or, or really seriously happy with 60 frames a second. That's not acceptable, simply not acceptable in a VR environment. And the fact that we have to have this much, much higher throughput, much lower latency is, is guiding us to do extra stuff just in the same way that in order to deliver those 30 or 60 frames a second, we've tuned our hardware for various things previously as well. So there's, there's a lot of custom work that we've done, mostly on the software side, but some on the hardware side too. I think we talked at uh, CES about the asynchronous compute engines. Um, that, that's something that we've been able to expose. So that's exposed in, uh, in Mantle, and it's out there in the, uh, uh, the, the SDKs for the current consoles, the PlayStation 4, the Xbox One, that kind of stuff. It's cool, it's groovy, and people know how to use it. One of the really great things is you can use it now in, a, in an Oculus kind of setup, in any VR kind of setup. You can use it to do what they call the, the asynchronous time warp. Ooh, scary, asynchronous time warp. The amazing thing is, by having these, these asynchronous compute engines, this really clever piece of tech that's built into the hardware, we can do that at zero cost. The time warp actually gets hidden in other work that's going on. And it looks like you have a GPU that's running flat out, and then you add more work to it, and it still does the same amount of work. That kind of, take, that kind of thing takes custom design, custom thought. So, yeah, we've, 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 we've got stuff to do on this, but we've tackled the big problems, and it's... It's a really important step towards the future. How far, I, forgive me, I'm not a programmer, so it, it's an ignoramus question here. How far, how big a difference is there between doing traditional coding for, for a game that needs this high throughput versus coding through this SDK, through Liquid VR? Is it a big difference between getting the content through? No, it, it, that, that's, that I think is one of the great things. So, um, you know, if you've seen the announcements from us over 2015, you'll know about uh, the FreeSync monitors where you have to do absolutely nothing. And it's not quite as simple as that. There are basically four API entry points which you can use to improve the VR experience. If you don't use them, you can still get things working, but you won't necessarily get the very best experience that you could. And if you use these four entry points just to tweak the way things work in, in fine-grained detail, then you can move from good to superlative and it's not a lot of work. It's really straightforward. Is there any advantage for traditional games that have nothing to do with VR 
to use Liquid VR for their you know, programming needs, or is it completely so far apart that you know, it wouldn't make sense to do it? No, actually, that, that's an interesting point. If you took a game that you had no intention of ever carrying to VR and you looked at this SDK, yeah, you could still pick out some value there. Uh, the main one I'd point out is that asynchronous compute engine. And it's something I was, uh, I was having a chat over breakfast with a programmer that I've known for a, a decade or more um, in the games business. And he was talking about the various uses that he makes of this ACE. And it's, it's great. You know, you, you create a, a piece of tech because you think it's a nice general way of solving problems. And some guy comes along and he has a really obscure idea and he's able to use your hardware to do cool stuff with it. Um, it absolutely solves problems both in VR and elsewhere. Now, what about cooperative uh, graphics cards? When you have more than one GPU in the system, uh, it, it, are there any special considerations taken with Liquid VR for scenarios like that? Um, you have a, a <clears throat> I guess, yes, the, the answer is there are a couple of special considerations. If you use Liquid VR efficiently, um, and the idea would then, then to, would be to extract the maximum throughput from the system. You could have a multi-GPU setup, so I think we have a, a Crossfire setup uh, running here. You can have both of those GPUs, one doing one eye, one doing the other eye. Now that's a huge step over AFR. If you're familiar with AFR, which is the traditional way of supporting Crossfire, then you have this alternation. One, one frame comes from one graphics card, one from the other. Well, that kind of alternation means they don't come at the same time, and that's a real problem if you have a VR experience. It's okay for an ordinary game where you're looking at something like 60 hertz, but it's totally unacceptable to have the eyes out of step with each other. Um, so that's a, a real advantage for VR, being able to do that. Um, and along with that kind of trick, you can also take, if you're, if you're really prepared to, uh, to invest the effort in it, you can not only have those two GPUs doing one for each eye, but if you have a third GPU in the system, because after all, AMD supplies APUs, which is a CPU plus a GPU, you can use that third GPU and you can do that. You, you can use that for other asynchronous tasks. You can, you can have it doing physics or AI or other kind of stuff. And you can get a tremendous amount of throughput from a system which is very heavily loaded. Now, we've been seeing so many displays on the market. I mean, everywhere I look, you're going to, well, actually, you know what, let's rewind a little bit. Mm -hmm. You didn't just do this on your, by yourself. Um, how did you go about creating Liquid VR? Did you have specific partners working with you? Yeah, really, really fair question, because it might look like AMD is trying to set the world on fire just with its own brilliant ideas, but who else is playing? Um, and the answer is that although we're showing here with Oculus, uh, we, have, we have some key tech here, which is about general compatibility. So one of the things you can do is you can just plug in an HMD, a head-mounted display, just connect it to the PC, and it doesn't come up as part of an extended desktop and create a huge amount of confusion for every consumer. And to do that kind of stuff, we've had to work with other, other folks in the ecosystem. So yeah, um, Oculus are the name. You know, If you talk about VR, then you must be talking about Oculus, mustn't you? But we've got Valve out there with, uh, with this great new setup with HTC. We have Razer have their own uh, head-mounted display, and they have uh, an open um, approach to, uh, to VR. All this kind of stuff is really important that we support. AMD is, from, from its very DNA, we absolutely believe in supporting ecosystems and growing things. So it's not about one partner. We may favor one partner with a particular uh, demo, but this is about the ecosystem as a whole, making sure it all works. So, uh, I mean, you, talk, you mentioned Oculus, I think you mentioned Valve. What about uh, you know, additional players like Immersion Varelia? I mean, there's other HMDs that are coming out. Can they just approach AMD and say, hey, we'd like you to support this as well? I mean, is it as simple as that? Yeah, really simple message. If you haven't come to us to ask for support, come to us and we'll do it. You should find that actually pretty much everything will work off the, uh, off the bat. The, the Liquid VR stuff is implemented in Mantle, which sits under the DX API in this case. Uh, you don't need to, to program your game in Mantle to get the advantages of it. <clears throat> um, and the, uh, the Direct Connect stuff, which is about this instant compatibility, this is supposed to work with every HMD, so there should be no problems there. Yeah. Now, we're, I, I, of course, you know, AMD, very big in the, in the graphics card business, obviously a very core business. Mm -hmm. You know, there's going to be all kinds of head mounts coming out to market, of course, Oculus, Valve, and, and, and several others. Do you have an idea what kind of graphics power is going to be needed to, to, to drive these things? Like, I mean, should, should people put some thought into the kind of hardware they should get ready for? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in the long term, if you're looking for a system which is close to, to visual perfection, then we have quite a way to go. You know, the, the graphics business has, uh, has another five or ten years of growth before it gets to that kind of situation. Um, plenty to go. Um, I think one of the things that you should look at if you're, if you're 
thinking about buying the graphics subsystem at the moment is think about scalability. Think about having one GPU where you can double it up. Um, and I would say this, wouldn't I? But you might want to think about getting some, some future AMD hardware, which will be coming along later this year. Uh, we're actually showing this on unannounced R9 um, flagship product that's coming later, that 2015. And that would be a great purchase. But that sounds a bit like advertising, so I won't say that. So if we look at the, the VR ecosystem as it is today, we've got the mobile world and we've got the desktop world. The, the mobile world makes it seem like just about any any smartphone could have effectively run VR. So why do you need a heavyweight PC? Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yep. so now in the in the PC world, uh, I mean, are people going to be aiming for you know super high level gaming platforms, or, or do you think this is going to pass as like a mid level type of technology as well? Well, it's, it's more than just gaming. One of the best things about VR is it has a lot of applications outside gaming. You've got things like medicine, education, advertising, uh, virtual presence in, in meetings, loads and loads of different uses for VR, which are, uh, which are exciting. Um, but for, oh, and, it, and in fact, one of the things that I haven't mentioned there is things like 3D movies, where you can, and this is what the Samsung Gear VR is, is, is all about, really, to me. It's about a beautiful experience with 3D movies, <clears throat> in the sense that you place yourself at a particular location, you don't get to move around in the movie and explore the different scenes. That would well, that, be kind of impossible for a movie. Um, but in that situation, it works superbly well. You have a, a, an interactive part to the experience of viewing an experience, viewing a, a story. Um, this is a different kind of thing. This is about producing a truly interactive environment where you can blow it up, you can destroy it, you can kill it, you can be killed by it if you're slow and sluggish like me. Um, but you have a content which is created on the fly. Every 90th of a second, this content is new. If you're watching a video, even if it's a 3D video and you're interacting, in the, in the end, you're watching a, a canned sequence. And this is, this is a different kind of world that we're trying to produce. And I think that's the, the fundamental difference. If you're doing it on a mobile phone, then you have a, a relatively low-end graphics solution, so you're not going to be doing the kind of awesome stuff that you look at here. If you run this demo, and, and Neil, I strongly recommend you take a look at it, then it feels like you're in the world. You don't see graphics artifacts. You don't see all of the problems which would spoil that sense of immersion, that sense of presence. Yeah. So th these demos, like, are, are they running? Can you talk about the generation of graphics card that's running on them? Um, we've been demoing for the last uh, six months or so at uh, press conferences using uh, the Tonga card, that's the R9 285. Um, anything thereabouts or higher will give you a, a pretty good experience for uh, developing um, on these. Uh, the actual demo that we're running today is, is on that unannounced um, high-end graphics product. And you know, the more horsepower that you can get, the better the experience will be. So although it makes me feel like I'm an advertising guy, and that's got to be a bad thing, hasn't it? Um, I, I really do believe that this kind of hardware is the, the great place to, to get a good VR experience. So aim yeah. high. Yeah, I think so, aim high, yeah. Certainly if you want that deep interactivity, that real sense of, of immersion where the world is not just convincingly portrayed around you as if it was a movie, but now you can get in and do stuff to it. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank, thank you so much for joining, joining us as always, Richard. Neil, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. This is Neil Schneider for MTBS-TV at GDC 2015. We will, of course, be back with more. Thank you for watching. Thank you.